Well, hello, everyone. My name is Audrey Scanlon. I'm the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Pennsylvania and working on a continuing series on women in ministry as we look forward to our previewing, or not previewing, the actual showing of the Philadelphia 11 movie on April 26th at St. Thomas Church in Lancaster. We're really, really excited about this movie. We're always excited about women in ministry. And today we have a really special guest with us, two special guests actually, um, to talk with us about women in ministry. We have uh, Julia Ayala Harris, who is the president of the House of Deputies, has been since 2022, and Sarah Stonecipher Boylan, who serves on my staff as the um, dean of the Stevenson School for Ministry, but also serves on Julia's um, council. Is it Council of Advice? Is mm -hmm. that That's right. So welcome to both of you. Um, Julia, we're really interested in hearing your thoughts about women's ministry. Now in 1970, was it 1974? I was still in high school and I don't think you were even born yet. <laughs> I right? was not yet born, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, that's when this, what we call the irregular ordination of 11 women in Philadelphia took place. I'm just wondering, as you reflect back on that, um, how do you think that changed the church? Oh, I think mm -hmm. one of the fundamental things that happened with the irregular, in air quotes, ordination of those 11 women is that our church, the Episcopal Church, was able to then push the door open a little bit more when it, especially when the next general convention came around to then allow for regular ordinations of women, but to push the door open for how we see leadership in the church and, and by that, how we see God. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of times when we, you know, children are a lot more open and free with uh, some of their perspectives. And when you talk to, you know, little kids or teenagers, when they see someone that is not someone that they traditionally see in leadership, so typically a straight white male of a certain age, mm -hmm. um, they're much more open to understanding that that parish priest that might be um, a black woman or a Latino or speaking Spanish or is is somehow by extension and another idea of what God is like, another image bearer of God. And they're very, they're much more likely than adults to say that out loud. But I think we as adults think that, and we're affected by that as well, that when we see a diversity of leadership and especially ordained leadership, we also expand our ideas and our notions of what our God, the diversity within our God. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that can be, um, it's just a wonderful gift that I think children give us when they remind us of that. I love that. You know, I'm I'm one of these folks who tries to not refer to God in a gendered way at all, mm -hmm. which makes for some awkward sentence structure in sermons when you say when you use God about six times in one sentence. But I think it's important. Um, I grew up thinking, of course, in the of God in the in is a guy with a gray beard, right? Mm -hmm. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, one of my childhood church in Kent, Connecticut, has a big stained glass window with a guy with um, a big gray beard. And years later, probably about 30 years after I left that church and went back and I was having lunch with a rector and we were at a restaurant, not at the church. And I said, tell me about that window with a picture of God in it. I mean, how how did anybody <laughs> come up with that? And he said, Audrey, that was Moses. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Oh my God! But you, but you grow up when you hear gender mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. And some of the children's Bibles that I had, um, there are lots of pictures of God as an old man with a white beard, mm -hmm. or Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes and very pale skin. Yeah, yeah. So I love the idea that including women in ordained ministry not only made all the ministry of women more robust in the Episcopal mm -hmm. church, but also even pushed out the envelope of how we, how we see God, God's self. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sarah, when you were growing up, what was your image of God? 
Oh gosh. Um, I think, I think it was still very traditional. I think it was still very traditional of white dude watching over all of us. Um, gray, grade wizened features. Um, but I, th I remember very early on in one Sunday school of like, we were asked to draw God and, you know, some kid next to me, like did like some celestial stars, clouds, amoeba thing. Mm -hmm. And like, and I mean, that was, so that was very different. That was very different to like, to witness God as, as, a, as a, again, sort of a, an ever present celestial being rather than one human like feature. Right. Exactly. I was getting comfortable with the Santa Claus God kind of overlap that we have, mm -hmm. you know, this very, you know, nor you know, with the beard and white because they're somehow Nordic and yeah, mm -hmm. male. <laughs> he sees you while you're sleeping. Yes, you know, it's, you're <laughs> it's always made me uncomfortable. Yeah. So before, or since 1974, then, Julia, you know, besides this expansive image of the deity, what do you think women have brought to the church? How has the church been enriched and, and um, made better by having women? Yeah, um, I think it comes down to with women or um, any other kind of diversity and leadership with lived experience mm -hmm. that you know, we have a different lived experience than, and especially those Philadelphia 11, when they first came into, um, into their leadership roles in that really prophetic, um, and powerful way, you know, saying, this is what life is like for me. And that's something that we're starting 50 years later, we're starting to have a better understanding of how people's lived experiences in their bodies is different based on their bodies, right. Based on, um, you know, having, uh, uh, the, I can piggyback on that. Yeah. It's an interesting, um, sort of false narrative that we like to buy into about women having softer skills or, you know, not having the harder, the harder stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, especially because of course we know that the church can only run when the parish administrator is on deck running the parish. Right. And the parish administrator still tends to be a woman. Or how many Sunday school coordinators are, you know, checking off who's in Sunday school, sending out postcards or texts to the family to say, hey, we missed you this Sunday. Love to have you back. Like all of that stuff is hard skills. But of course, that's somehow regulated to, you know, the more the women's roles in the church, even mm -hmm. today. Yeah. And somehow undervalued. And yet we have amazing male priests who are incredibly gifted at the pastoral side, at the compassion side, at being able to be vulnerable with parishioners. And so it's it's a, a total false narrative that we tell ourselves all the time and that we justify even in 2024. Yeah. Sarah, in your role as the dean of the school, have you noticed any sort of gender differences among the people that are training for ministry in our church or... Do you kind of try to downplay that or is, is, have you experienced anything like that? It's a good question. I don't know if I've really reflected on that a lot. Um, mainly because, uh, because they're showing up for ministry, they've already been approached and they've gone through the rigor of a commission on ministry and parish discernment committee. And so I think I, I sort of approach it as, you know, this is, this is how God is living out your calling right now and how you're embracing your calling. And so for me, it ends up being, um, gender neutral. Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of how, how I approach it. And I think, you know, there's always a spectrum of how, of how people interact with you. <laughs> and so I don't, I, a lot of that, I don't associate with gender though. So I do think about sort of the, what it, what have you done in a previous life? How does that manifest itself? Um, what, what are the skills that you're bringing in and how, do, how, do, how, do, how does that react to your current situation right now as a student? Because as, as we all know, there's different power dynamics and um, ways of accommodating your, your skills and talents um, depending on sort of what you're doing. And so I, I wonder sometimes of, you know, if you have somebody who is typically a manager um, and then all of a sudden they're 
thrown back into a student role as well as a postulant role how does how does that how does that dynamic shift their understanding and appreciation of what's happening or up their up their anxiety which is almost always the case <laughs> You know, it's interesting you say that because I'm um, occasionally with new bishops at the College for Bishops, at which you also serve, Sarah, on that board. And it's interesting to see people who are so well accomplished in their life and ministry. And then here they are as, you know, we used to call them baby bishops. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> but, you know, they are in a, in a role that's totally new to them. And so mm -hmm. to see folks who are accomplished professionals suddenly thrown back into being a novice at something, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Um, Julia, I'm curious, mm -hmm. you know, I know that you've, you've been the president of the House of Deputies for a couple of years, and we're so grateful for your leadership. I think um, you and Bishop Curry have really helped us to see that the church is changing. Um, you know, we hold on to the rock that's Jesus, but the church is shifting. And I'm curious, before we finish up, I'd love to hear what your, what your hopes and dreams are for the church going forward. Yeah, I, um, I can't help but cling to sort of the bigger vision, which is, um, and I hope this doesn't sound too far-fetched or philosophical or whatever, but it's it's where I'm at today, which is that I hope that the church can be a place and a beacon where everyone can see and feel the love of God. And I just, I think that, and I can't help but shake that, like that's the overarching vision, that's the overarching hope. And that in some way, as we look at the post-pandemic society, post-pandemic church, we move forward with who we are as Episcopalians in this, in during these changing and challenging times, that we figure out and articulate who, what is our identity as Episcopalians? Because we do have so much to offer, particularly in who we accept in our pews, who we accept in ordained and lay ministry and um and how we see god and i think that that is a pivotal piece to being able to welcome people or partner with other denominations to help bring the love of god to our hurting world excellent i have to say that one of the real gifts of the work that i do is on sundays when i'm confirming but especially receiving people into our tradition i get to hear their stories of how they found us and why they stayed. I always ask them that. How did you find <laughs> us and why did you stick around? Because I think that we do have something really special to offer and mm -hmm. we're doing a good job. Anything either of you want to throw in before we stop recording? I have one more thing. I don't know yeah. if you knew this, Audrey. Mm -hmm. So I grew up Catholic and spent a few years evangelical trying to find my way in, mm -hmm. in, um, and I had heard about the Episcopal Church through a college professor and a fellow student, but I didn't do any research ahead of time or anything and walked in one Sunday um, to the 11 a.m. service. So I slept in some and, <laughs> and then walked up to the communion rail. And it was the first time I knelt for communion and I, it, everything was quite confusing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I put out my hand for the communion wafer and a painted nail of a woman put the communion wafer in my hand. And I looked up and it was a woman priest. Oh, wow. And it had never occurred to me that women could be in leadership either in the Catholic church or the evangelical church. Mm -hmm. And it was in that moment that I was completely sold on the Episcopal church it was because a woman priest put the communion wafer in my hand. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yesterday I was with, um, I was up at St. Paul's in Wellsboro, way up north in our diocese, and they had three acolytes, and two of them were girls. They were the torchbearers, and I looked at them and I said, you know, when I was your age, I really wanted to do what you're doing right now. <laughs> and my brothers complained every Sunday because they had to acolyte. <laughs> but I had to be in the junior choir because we couldn't have girls inside the altar rail. Right. So, Thank God the church has changed, right? Right, right. Sometimes slowly. 
but yeah, yeah. happening. Well, in your lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sarah, in Sarah's lifetime. Anyway, <laughs> listen, thank you, Julia, for being here. It's an honor to have the president of the House of Deputies with us for our Friday video series. And Sarah, thank you, Audrey, for having you. me. Um, it's great to speak with both of you today. So, Sarah, I'm going to let you hit stop record. I will. I will do that. Mm -hmm.